Yes, thank you for the invitation to preach. Not once, but twice the McVeins are going to be here. And um, I bring you greetings from the Northern Baptist Association. Yesterday, we had a trustees away day uh, in Hartlepool. Uh, Phil was there as well. And we were reminded how, as an association of Baptist churches in the North, we are building together for God's kingdom. We are part of the wonderful mosaic of God's kingdom here. And um, you have been studying Mark now for a wee while. You've got to chapter 7, and we're going to read it in a moment together, the passage I've been given. And when I didn't know what Mark 7 was initially, and I thought, oh, I'll I'll have a miracle. I'll have um, an amazing story of action, because we know that Mark is known as the action gospel. We'll have some amazing life-changing encounter. It'll be short, it'll be to the point. But here in chapter seven, we've got something rather different. And um, I'm gonna read it, and I'm gonna help us see why would Mark give 23 verses to this? And it's because it's got a really explosive, important message. So uh, let me read us uh, the passage from today. It's Mark seven, he speaks, Jesus is speaking to a religious crowd, and I'm going to read the first 23 verses. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of the disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe. The washing up of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them. Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had from me is korban, that is an offering to God, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother. That's making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on, and you do many things like this. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile? since it enters not the heart, but the stomach, and goes out into the sewer. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles, for what is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Well done, everyone. You stuck with that? That's a long passage in Mark. 23 verses about laws from antiquarian society. What are we thinking about this morning? But this message is so important. And uh, Jesus knew that he had to take a different line to what was being said to him. He had a message that the listeners did not perhaps want to hear, but it was so important that he knew that he had to be careful and clear. 
He was walking a white, a, a tightrope, uh, was Jesus in this situation. And if you think about what happened uh, in our country this week, this is an example, perhaps, of how explosive what Jesus was going to say. It's a bit like a political party taking 10, 15 million pounds of donations from someone who reportedly said that MP Diane Abbott should be shot and made him want to hate all black women. It was that outrageous, what was Jesus going to say, that he had to be very careful this morning how he was going to describe it to his listeners. And that's why Mark has included this passage in his gospel. So let me get going. I've got an eye on the clock. I know we have communion. Trust me. So the first point I want to make is um, about... The, well, let me start with a fun fact of Mark. Why do scholars think that Mark was writing to people that were not from a Jewish background? Because he put this passage here. He put this passage here explaining all the rules and regulations of washing in the law because if he was writing to Jews, he wouldn't need to explain all this. They knew it. They lived by it. The question of food, what you eat, who you eat it with, how clean you must be to eat was a major symbol of the Jewish identity of the first century. And so Mark is clearly writing to people that didn't know all about it. And it, must, it does seem confusing, all the rules and regulations. Maybe it's easier to think of um, a doctor preparing to go into surgery and they, they take a lot of time scrubbing up. It had to be very, very clean. clean. And God was saying in the Old Testament that these, these laws, were, ancient laws, were so important because of all the dirt that was around, the sin, the brokenness, and it can do damage to the physical body. We know that. If you're not clean, you can damage your physical body. If there's dirt, if there's disease, if there's decay, you can become isolated you can become alienated by others. You need to wash and be clean so that infection doesn't spread. And if you think today, I mean, we don't need to think for a moment very long about what's happening, whether it be in Ukraine or, or Russia or Gaza or parts of Africa. Think about Port-au-Prince, <coughs> what's happening. The, the, the brokenness of this world, the wars, the outside and inside our families that rage. We know that how difficult and misshapen and disfigured our world has become. So this is like, this wasn't just for the first century, was it? It wasn't just for the Old Testament times. This view is, is universal and it's lasted a long time. It was uh, lovely to hear of someone that ha has been exposed to Shakespeare this week. Is that Olivia? Romeo and Juliet. Well, I want to tell you, just as an example, to think about, think about, I don't know if any of you have ever come across um, or watched or read Macbeth, another of um, Shakespeare's plays. And there's Lady Macbeth in a famous scene uh, where she is washing, washing, washing her hands. She's washing her hands because she thinks she can see blood on them. And she's got a very guilty conscience because she's been tied up in all sorts of murderous things. And she's almost sleepwalking and she's saying, out, down, spot, out, I say, one, two, then there's the time to do it. Hell is so murky. And she's washing and she's washing and there's nothing there. It's in her mind, but she's got such a guilty conscience. And we think, oh, who, who, the, was it just the people, the Pharisees, that were all into the washing? Was it the, the priests in the Old Testament that were just in the washing? Actually, if we think about it, we all have things that we are washing, we are feeling dirty about. Perhaps you think, I am so, must, everything in my life must be so perfect. I can't make a mistake. You, you're really wanting to be perfect.
perfect in every way and you're washing, you're trying to be clean? Or are you thinking about your appearance? What you have is so important that you don't tell anyone where your money is coming from and where it goes. Are you washing? You've got a dirty conscience, perhaps. Or are you full of bitterness? You're washing away and you're so cross and angry about how life has turned out for you. We're washing. Even today we find that we're washing things, uh, washing our hands because we're not feeling great about ourselves. It wasn't just in the Old Testament. It wasn't just for Lady Macbeth. It wasn't just these obscure rules that the Pharisees followed that happened. Because it's very easy for a passage like this to say, oh, that was all about the Pharisees. It wasn't about us. But actually, we all think we can clean our dirt. We're all washing in different ways without realising it, perhaps. The second point, could you just go to show screen, uh, slideshow, please? So then you can't see the other ones. If you go to the slideshow button at the top, that one, and then just do from current slide, second one in. Second slide, thank you, David. So the other point, the point that goes on to um, point two that I want to make is that just as in the Old Testament times and the New Testament times, people were inconsistent about how they applied the rules. Jesus says that we are all finding ways to make ourselves clean. The Pharisees had said, right, Okay, in the Old Testament times, it was the priests that cleaned, but now, in this time of the first century, everyone must wash to be clean. They were very good at putting up a fence around what was acceptable and what wasn't. And Jesus was saying, if you are doing the same as this, you are ignoring the principles of God's law. We're very good at deciding who's in and who's out, and then are we consistent and should we be thinking in that way and I wanted just to share with you some re action research that has been going on over the last two years amongst our Baptist movement and I don't know if any of you have heard of Project Violet oh yes got a yes there Project Violet has, is a really interesting uh, thing that's been going because in, and it's named after Violet Hedger, who was the first Baptist woman to be trained at college for ordination. How long do you think the Baptist movement has, has acknowledged women ministers amongst them? It's over 100 years. Over 100 years, the Baptist movement have um, trained and ordained women. And so Project Violet is, has been looking at a reflection on, okay, we've had women ministers for 100 years plus now. What can we reflect on uh, mis 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 I can't say the word. missionally, structurally, and theologically together? And I've started, uh, I've put on this slide, this is the second point, David. Thank you. I've put on this slide, if you're interested, a link to a very interesting podcast that is talking about Project Violet and what the research is showing. And you can go on and you can listen to stories and you can find out some of the reflections that's been happening. On the 2nd of May, the full results are going to be out. So these um, podcasts are like a trailer for the research. And I have to say, it's been quite illuminating to listen to. And it's also been my experience here in Northern Baptist Association that despite women being called to be a leader, behind the scenes they've been patronised, ignored and even undermined by church members. And it's been interesting to see as well this inconsistency of approach. Yes, yes, we recognise women in ministry, but behind the scenes there's sometimes very harmful, what could be said is banter, but it's harmful conversations happening. We have a, sometimes an inconsistent, a two-faced approach 
to whether folk are submitting to women in ministry or whether they're belittling and criticising their ministry. Even worse, making, making up that perhaps a man would do a better job. We struggle sometimes to be consistent in our approach as Jesus followers. And that wasn't just in the first century. It can be difficult. We are living in divergent times when there can be multiple answers to the question. And yet there seems to be less and less tolerance for different views. So I need to take us to the third point because how do we hold together the tensions and how do we get over this thing that we just want to try and be cleaning ourselves? We are inconsistent. And so we go to the third point, that this was the key thing. Jesus spoke this piece away from the crowd. He took them, he's speaking to the big crowd, and then he's just with his disciples because he wants to go to the root of the problem. And it was so explosive, submer subversive, it was like burning a flag or, or painting a revolutionary slogan on a palace wall because what he said was, it's not what goes in that makes you dirty, it's what that comes out that makes you dirty. So the real uncleanliness comes from our heart and that's where the thoughts of evil can be lurking. If you think about world religions, so often they say, if you do this, if you do that, if you do the other, you follow the rules, you follow the regulations, it will be fine. Or if you think about what is the advice on Facebook or in bookshops at the moment, it's, it's about work harder on yourself. The answers are all within you. And Jesus was saying, he was saying, I have come to fulfill the law. I have come to show a different way. I have come to usher in the kingdom, the kingdom where he is reigning, where he can help us be clean through forgiveness and through a new start. There's a deeper truth that these laws were pointing to, and it had arrived. He was telling his disciples, I'm here, I have arrived. When God becomes king, he provides the cure. Everything changes. Jesus' message of forgiveness and healing was not just to remove the old guilt or the old disease, but to renew us, the whole person, from the inside out. He was announcing the kingdom of God. And there is a way for all of creation to be made new. He was bringing in this new way. And just as many of us see a world with lots of legislation where it's all about the hard-hearted, sometimes we can't see or recognize the kingdom of God breaking in right there in our midst. And that was happening in the first century and it happens now too. Sometimes we let our rules and our traditions color our ability to taste, to see, to smell, and to touch God's kingdom breaking in. And so I'm gonna give you a few pointers of how you can see God's kingdom breaking in, that the outside, the, the, the newness of life comes bubbling up from the inside as God becomes king as Jesus takes his place. Do you believe that every human being is born in the image of God? Do you believe that God's mission on earth that started, and we're going to be celebrating together, with the resurrection of Jesus was heralding a new chapter of God's reign. So we can look for signs of the kingdom in Hartlepool this week, in our lives this week, because we have that experience of becoming clean and being part of God's kingdom. 
And so, as a community pastor, I'll give an example for you how I am, it, how I am looking for signs of the kingdom breaking in. This is one of the prayers I pray each day. Be in the heart of each to whom I speak, in the mouth of each who speaks unto me. So being about my day, looking for these opportunities to see God in the situation I'm in. Being attentive to the person that I'm spending time with, noticing what's going on, and beginning to see glimpses of the kingdom breaking in. And it's so thrilling to hear of the ministries here at Oxford Road, whether it be the community, grocery, and all that's um, involved in bringing God's kingdom here, whether it's what's going to be going on in the schools this week as the Message Trust bring the story of, of a restoration and that chance of having not striving but being given that chance to be clean. One of the stories from my week is this. I um, help at the baby bank in Hartlepool uh, as a volunteer and um, I've been really fortunate to uh, meet a young mum um, and she's from Albania and uh, I from our past uh, we've, we've lived in Albania so I, I've been able to connect with her through speaking her language Albanian and um, she comes in every now and again to bring things to get things with her son and we connect well, I was in Middleton Grange on Thursday, and uh, not only did I meet this mum and her child, but she was with three others. And um, they looked absolutely bemused at me and this woman speaking. Me with my faulty, bad accented, wrong grammar, stuttering Albanian, but they recognized something. Oh, you're speaking our language. And so we shared, and I really sensed in that moment, in the middle of town, a wonderful sense of hospitality, of welcome, of acceptance of these women that are feeling how tough life is for them in a new place. And I sensed that it was a bit of God's kingdom there being exposed of his love, his acceptance. And what's happening tomorrow at two o'clock is that we're meeting four of us in town to have coffee together. It's a very Albanian thing to do as women, meet to have coffee. And so we have a WhatsApp group and an opportunity to share things. And prayer that God's kingdom will come on earth as it's heaven. Not just in that situation, but just think about as we go to communion today, what situations are you coming into this week? Encounters where God can become king, where people can have that opportunity to sense something beyond their struggles, sense something of the eternal love, hope of God and his peace. So as I close... If you go to the last slide, please. I'd like us to think as we prepare to take communion, what is it that the Lord has shown you today? Is it that you're trying too hard to keep washing things when you actually know that dirt needs to be brought to the Lord in prayer today for his strength to become ever more like him? Perhaps you found me mentioning this inconsistent approach to, to women uncomfortable. Maybe you want to have a think about that, about the inconsistencies we see. Or perhaps you're bursting to tell stories of how broken people are becoming clean. And I'd encourage you, over coffee today, share the stories of God becoming clean in your life. We're um, recognizing that this morning with uh, Shazia, but also for others. And we have got wonderful opportunities this week to pray for that kingdom of God 
it's, it's breaking in, but it's also there to be exposed. So as young people find that there are other ways to think about their future, that is an uncovering of this beautiful flourishing of God's kingdom where his reign will be glorious. And he, Jesus has come to herald that in. And even 21 centuries on, we are still noticing this kingdom breaking in. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that as we come to share around communion now, that you will help us. Help us, Lord, as we consider this week help us Lord as we consider the challenges and the opportunities ahead that we would know your transforming power within us from you your gift We thank you that we have before us the symbols of, of your table, your feast, entering in the new banquet of your reign, and we thank you for the opportunity to reflect together. And Lord, we continue to pray for your kingdom to come on earth as in heaven, as we ask this in your name. Amen.